War in the Cities A Maoist Perspective on First World Lumpen Introduction What is the Lumpen Proletariat? A concise but accurate answer to this important preliminary question can be found in the glossary of terms of the Encyclopedia of Marxism, which itself can be found in the Marxist Internet Archive. The following quote is the definition of the Lumpen Proletariat, or Lumpen for short, included in the Encyclopedia. It reads, Roughly translated as slum workers or the mob, this term identifies the class of outcast that generated and submerged elements that make up a section of the population of industrial centers. It includes beggars, prostitutes, gangsters, racketeers, swindlers, petty criminals, tramps, chronic unemployed or unemployables, persons who have been cast out by industry, and all sorts of declassed, degraded, or degenerated elements. In times of prolonged crisis, depression, innumerable young people also who cannot find an opportunity to enter into the social organism as producers are pushed into this limbo of the outcast. From this definition of the lumpen alone, one can already begin to understand just how much this class is reviled by almost every strata of class society. To the bourgeoisie, the lumpen are an annoying statistic. To the petty bourgeoisie, they are dangerous ne'er-do-wells. And even the proletariat, that class which detests the injustices of capitalism more than any other, often see the lumpen as no more than greedy parasites leeching off the working class. Even the revolutionary progenitors of the modern communist movement, Marx and Engels, detested the lumpen. To Marx, they were scum, part of the dangerous classes mentioned in the Communist Manifesto. To Engels, they were scoundrels so depraved they considered any leader of the workers' movement who sought to win them over to the side of the proletariat an absolute traitor to the revolutionary struggle. What kind of movement could incorporate the thieves, murderers, and panhandlers of society? What kind of movement of the people who live off of honest labor could incorporate the likes of those who live off of charity or crime? The truth is, while the bourgeoisie's hatred of the lumpen could be chalked up to their class-typical hatred of poor people, the proletariat's hatred of lumpen has a bit more of a basis in objective reality. A great many lumpen do have the blood of working people in their hands. Many of them have killed and stolen from their working class neighbors. Historically speaking, the lumpen proletariat have also served as the basis of mass anti-worker reactionary movements, such as Bonapartism, which was one major source of Marx and Engels' understanding of the class as at best untrustworthy and at worst downright dangerous. However, there is more to the lumpen than simple criminality or parasitism. Mao recognized this as he studied the various classes in Chinese society in an effort to find potential allies of China's relatively small proletariat among the nation's wide variety of classes. In his analysis of the classes in Chinese society, Mao wrote the following about the lumpen. Apart from all these other classes, there is the fairly large lumpen proletariat, made up of peasants who have lost their land and handicraftsmen who cannot get work. They lead the most precarious existence of all. One of China's difficult problems is how to handle these people. Brave fighters but apt to be destructive, they can become a revolutionary force if given proper guidance. Mao possessed a nuanced view of the lumpen. He recognized the fact that Marx and Engels were not incorrect in the recognition of the destructive capacities of the lumpen proletariat, as well as the inherent difficulty of incorporating that class into the workers' movement, but qualified their position on the lumpen by suggesting that, with proper guidance by the industrial proletariat, the lumpen also had the potential to be a revolutionary force in China. Mao's position on the lumpen proletariat was certainly more nuanced than that of Marx and Engels, However, considering the dangers of including the lumpen into the workers' movement that were recognized by Marx, Engels, and Mao alike, one might wonder why the Chinese proletariat and their communist party would even risk aligning themselves with such a class. 
The answer to this question lies in Mao's approach to making revolution in China, which was the reason why he went about performing an analysis of China's various classes in the first place. Mao explained his approach at the beginning of his analysis of the classes in Chinese society in this way. Who are our enemies? Who are our friends? This is a question of the first importance for the revolution. The basic reason why all the previous revolutionary struggles in China achieved so little was their failure to unite with their real friends in order to attack real enemies. A revolutionary party is the guide to, of the masses, and no revolution ever succeeds when the revolutionary party leads them astray. To ensure that we will definitely achieve success in our revolution and will not lead the masses astray, we must pay attention to uniting with our real friends in order to attack our real enemies. To distinguish real friends from real enemies, we must make a general analysis of the economic status of the various classes in Chinese society and of their respective attitudes towards the revolution. During that period of time, China was a peripheral country that was dominated through neo-colonial imperialism by the core countries of the capitalist world system. This led to China's dependency on said countries and subsequent underdevelopment, meaning that China's economy was one characterized by a mixture between capitalist and pre-capitalist modes of production, with the pre-capitalist modes of production remaining dominant in a very large part of the country, all because China's underdevelopment benefited the core countries that were exploiting the nation. One consequence of this state of underdevelopment was China's lack of a large industrial proletariat in comparison to its multiplicity of other classes such as the peasantry. Because imperialism had to be overthrown before China could develop a large proletariat and then march forward to socialism and communism, an anti-imperialist revolution had to be carried out. While the proletariat was the class with the most immediate interest in liberating China from imperialism, it was not the only class with that interest, nor was it capable of liberating China by itself. This is why the Chinese proletariat, and by extension, Mao himself, had to search for allies in the anti-imperialist struggle in the other classes in Chinese society, even though their ultimate goal was proletarian socialist revolution. The Lumpen proletariat was one of these classes. As we now know, Mao's method of distinguishing between friends and enemies of the proletariat and then uniting with real friends in order to better combat real enemies was correct, because the new democratic and proletarian socialist revolutions were ultimately successful in China. Even though the material conditions that characterized peripheral China during the early to mid 20th century were vastly different from those extant in the imperialist core countries today, there are still very many lessons first world communists can take from the Chinese revolutionary experience. Even in the imperialist core countries, communists fighting for proletarian revolution must identify our friends and enemies so that we may determine who to unite with and who to oppose. In order to do this, we must understand the class structure of the countries in the imperialist core. The stagnation of class struggle in core countries and the search for allies of the proletarian revolution. Why is it that the working class in the imperialist core countries seem to have a tendency towards social liberalism at best and conservatism at worst, and in addition to that, harbor a general hostility toward communism and socialism? Why has there never been any successful revolution in the core countries, but a multiplicity of revolutions have succeeded in the peripheral ones? For communists who seek to understand the class structure of states in the parasitic core of the capitalist imperialist world system, these are essential questions that must be answered. Luckily for us, the late Egyptian Marxist Samir Amin answered these questions for us in his essay, The Crisis of Imperialism. Samir Mian understood that the modern class structures of countries within the imperialist core have their roots in the rise of monopoly capitalism and imperialism. He explained that, Monopolism, in fact, made possible, for the first time, the export of capital on a scale hitherto unthinkable. This gave a new momentum to the unequal international division of labor and extended the exploitation by monopolies to all the producers of the system. But this exploitation was extended by dividing the producers, that is, by subjecting them to different rates of exploitation. First, in the sector governed by outright capitalist relations of production, different rates were paid at the center and at the periphery to the same labor force which produced identical goods or close substitutes with the same productivity. Imperialism has made it possible for workers in the imperialist core countries to receive a much higher amount of pay for our labor even if it is the complete equivalent to the labor that our third world counterparts receive pennies for. Samir Amin described the consequences of this shift in the capitalist world system as 
The hegemony of the labor aristocracy over the first world working class, the reduction of Marxism to an economist ideological expression, and the bureaucratization and nationalist betrayal of the working class parties of the Second International, which were imperialism's political results. In Amin's words, the workers in the poor countries quote unquote accepted the revisionist hegemony of the liberal imperialist social democratic parties because of the drastically increased pay they received as a result of imperialism. Samir Amin explained the shifts this caused in the world revolutionary struggle against capitalism in the following manner. With imperialism, the principal contradiction of the capitalist system tends to be between monopoly capital and the overexploited masses of the periphery. The center of gravity of the struggles against capital tends to shift from the center of the system towards its periphery. The very super exploitation of the toiling masses in the global periphery that allows workers in the core to receive such high wages is simultaneously the reason why revolutionary struggle for socialism has succeeded only in the global periphery and still remains significantly more intense in those countries than in the core countries. Many communists in core countries are disappointed by this and don't want to face up to the reality that European and North American white people are not at the center of the global struggle for a new society, even though they are at the center of literally everything, including the imperialist world system from which they benefit. So they do mental gymnastics and twist Marxism in order to deny reality and convince themselves of a false narrative constructed from their Eurocentric fantasies. On this type of thinking, Samir Amin wrote, the essence of revisionism is precisely to deny this principal contradiction, to deny that the division of the working class at the center has objective basis, and to attribute it to the subjective factor, betrayal by the leaders, etc. To deny that the working class at the periphery can become the essential force of a liberation which, from being national at the beginning, becomes social in the end, and to deny that this possibility also has objective basis, imperialist, exploitation. So there you have it. In the imperialist core, the working class will tend to accept the leadership of liberal parties that perpetuate imperialism because imperialism allows the workers to live relatively well in comparison to their third world counterparts because of the high wages that the core workers are able to receive as a result of the super exploitation of workers in the periphery. So when we communists in the first world ask ourselves, who are our friends? Who are our enemies? We are struck with a shocking realization that large amounts of the workers in our countries are not necessarily our friends, even though the imperialist bourgeoisie and monopoly capital remain our sworn enemies. These facts leave communists in first world countries pleading for an answer to the question, what is to be done? Because the principal contradiction of the capitalist imperialist world system today is the one that exists between the parasitic core and the super exploited periphery of the system, communists in the core must find some way to align ourselves with the toiling masses of the periphery by building a broad united front against imperialism and colonialism. Besides the scattered first world proletarians that the bourgeoisie has not managed to buy off with imperialist super profits, the greatest allies of the communist movement within the imperialist core countries are the peoples of the internal colonies of those countries, as well as the members of the class that is the focus of the video, the first world lumpen. The unique socioeconomic position of first world lumpen and the possibility of lumpen radicalization. In his essay, The Lumpen Proletariat and the Revolutionary Youth Movement, Dr. Bruce Franklin, an American leftist scholar and cultural historian who was heavily associated with the American Maoist movement of the 60s and 70s, asserted the immense importance of one aspect of Franz Fanon's theoretical conception of the Lumpen. Fanon felt that in revolutionary situations of the anti-colonial or anti-imperialist type, the Lumpen proletariat is often the class which transmits revolutionary fervor from the countryside, where revolutions in the global south often begin, to the cities, which are often the last strongholds of the colonial or neo-colonial government being overthrown. Franklin borrowed Fanon's concept of the Lumpen, which was based on Fanon's analysis of struggles in peripheral nations and conceived of a way to apply Fanon's understanding of the Lumpen proletariat to the social context of the imperialist United States. He wrote, How does Franz Fanon's theoretical conception of the Lumpen apply to the US? It is easy enough to see the unemployed people of the black ghettos as part of this mass of humanity. 
But where is the rebellion that began in the country districts? The answer, of course, is in the World Revolution as described by Lin Biao in Long Live the Victory of People's War. The country districts of the world are Asia, Africa, and Latin America, homelands of the wretched of the earth. There are various groups of people in the United States who share the physical misery of these rural masses. American Indians, Chicano farm laborers, black tenant farmers in the South, the dispossessed whites of Appalachia. But most of these groups are scattered and weak, living on the fringes of capitalist society, away from its vital centers. There is only one group that not only shares the degradation of the world's revolutionary masses, but is sufficiently concentrated to attack imperialism at home, the urban lumpen proletariat. Franklin viewed the first world lumpen proletariat as a relatively large class that, like the scattered regular proletariat within the imperialist core, and unlike the labor aristocracy brought off by imperialist super profits, is affected so negatively by the capitalist system that there exists a strong, objective material basis for the development of anti-capitalist political consciousness among members of the class. For this reason, Dr. Franklin theorized that the first world lumpen proletariat is likely to be a major avenue through which the anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist sentiments that have already developed a sustained presence in the global south could rise again in the imperialist core. In the eyes of Dr. Franklin, the political radicalization of lumpen, as well as lumpen identification with third world revolutionary struggles, could potentially be understood as the occurrence on a global scale of the aforementioned revolutionary process described on a national scale by Franz Fanon, in which the lumpen transmit revolutionary sentiment from the countryside to the cities. Dr. Franklin derived this understanding of the essential processes behind world revolution as larger scale versions of the revolutionary processes in individual nations from the Chinese communist Lin Biao's view that the theoretical conception of the basic processes of anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist people's war are applicable not only on a national level, but on a global level as well as one could understand peripheral nations as a global countryside of sorts in which the revolutionary masses establish bases of power and begin to surround and weaken the parasitic core states, thus creating the necessary conditions for the revolutionary overthrow of the core states, which themselves could be seen as cities of sorts that represent the final barrier between the revolutionary masses and total liberation thus serving the same role in global people's war as physical cities serve in national ones. Therefore, if on the national scale, the lumpen were the ones to bring the revolutionary sentiments of the countryside to the cities, it may be possible for the first world lumpen to be the ones to bring the revolutionary sentiments of the quote-unquote global countryside, i.e. the third world, to the global cities they call home. Dr. Franklin further described the unique relationship between the capitalist system within the imperialist United States and the U.S. lumpen when he wrote, Wherever the lumpen proletariat lives in America, law and order are rapidly disintegrating. Imperialism, caught in its own contradictions, finds it increasingly difficult to develop effective weapons to use within its own diseased vital organs, its cities. Here stirs the lumpen proletariat the one class whose physical existence approximates that of the main forces of the world revolution. While it is without a doubt a bit of a stretch to argue that the socioeconomic position of the lumpen proletariat of imperialist core countries is the same as, or even almost the same as, the socioeconomic position of the super-exploited proletariat and peasantry of the global south, it cannot be denied that, unlike many of the workers in the center of the imperialist world system, the center's lumpen have not been bought off with the spoils of imperialist super-exploitation, and by their very nature as a class, barred from participation in the legitimate or legal capitalist economy, will most likely never Ever benefit from the surplus value extracted from the toil of the third world masses as the various first world classes that are able to participate in the legitimate or legal economies of their nations have. Therefore, it is possible for many lumpen to come to the realization that the essential cause of their destitution is the capitalist mode of production and align themselves with the communist movement even before the material basis for mass anti-communist sentiment decreases significantly as a result of a deep crisis of the imperialist world system. It is here where the special significance of the first world lumpen proletariat lies. In the efforts by communists in the imperialist core of the world system to unite all that can be united, first world communists can bring together the absolute lowest stratum of workers in the first world and lumpen proletarians that can be won over, thus forming a mass basis for a revolutionary anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist movement capable of putting an end to the stagnation of class struggle in the core of the imperialist world system. 
The Political Education of First World Lumpen now that both the nature of the unique socio-economic position occupied by the First World Lumpen, as well as a theoretical rationale for their incorporation into the communist movement within imperialist countries has been established, it is possible to move on to an exploration of a few major problems and possibilities that arise from Lumpen participation in the First World's communist movement. Because political education is often the beginning of an individual's journey toward becoming a revolutionary, I feel that it is most appropriate to discuss first the problems associated with the political education of the Lumpen, as well as the possibility for a new type of political education process made possible by the unique life circumstances faced by the Lumpen proletariat. Before I get into describing the various processes and methods through which the Lumpen can receive political education, I will first take the time to dispel some problematic myths that have arisen within the communist movement that have become obstacles not only to efforts to politically educate the Lumpen, but to the efforts to politically educate the normal proletariat and even the efforts to continue the political education of people who are already a part of the communist movement. The first of these myths is the mistaken idea that revolutionaries do not need to understand Marxist theory to effectively engage in revolutionary struggle. Regarding Lumpen specifically, I've seen this argument used by comrades as an excuse to promote the engagement of Lumpen in revolutionary struggle without dealing with the hardship of overcoming difficulties of encouraging the political education of Lumpen, which is why I have chosen to debunk this myth in this video despite the fact that the myth discourages the political education of more than just the Lumpen. This view is problematic because it encourages people to engage in aimless praxis as part of a struggle against a system that they don't understand. Marx spent a great deal of his life engaged in rigorous study of the capitalist system because he knew that neither he nor anyone else could succeed in the battle against capitalism without a detailed understanding of that mode of production. The only correct understanding of the relationship between theory and revolutionary praxis is the dialectical understanding that theory and praxis are in fact a unity of two opposites that depend on one another as two halves of one whole Marxist method. That means that both theory and practice are completely useless without their opposite. Mao skillfully described this dialectical unity in his own way in the following quote from his preface and postscript to Rural Surveys, which reads, Stalin rightly says that theory becomes purposeless if it is not connected with revolutionary praxis. And he rightly adds that practice gropes in the dark if its path is not illumined by revolutionary theory. Nobody should be labeled a narrow empiricist except the practical man who gropes in the dark and lacks perspective and foresight. Mao rightly chastised those communists who, favoring quote-unquote practicality, refused to engage in the study necessary for them to develop the basic theoretical knowledge they need to inform their approach to anti-capitalist struggle. He did this by describing such comrades as men groping in the dark, unable to take any effective revolutionary action because they lack the shining light of revolutionary theory, which is the only thing capable of pushing back the darkness of ignorance and revealing how the world really is. Any comrade who ignores the necessity of developing a firm theoretical grounding and deviates into the era of empiricism by relying solely on their own personal experiences to understand society will inevitably lack the broad perspective they need in order to understand capitalism well enough to develop effective methods of struggle against it. Mao hinted at this in the previous quote, but further expounded on this issue in his speech rectify the party's style of work in which he said, those experienced in work must take up the study of theory and must read seriously. Only then will they be able to systemize and synthesize their experience and raise it to the level of theory. Only then will they not mistake their partial experience for the universal truth and not commit empiricist errors. Allow me to sum all of that up as clearly as possible. No, it is not true that communist revolutionaries do not have to read theory. It is not the only thing that is vital to engagement in effective struggle against capitalism, but it is certainly a necessity if one wishes to make real contributions to that struggle and advance it in any way. No one does not have to read every single volume of Capital, the entire collective works of Lenin and Mao, and everything Louis Althusser has ever written in order to develop a solid grounding in theory. But if one refuses to do some type of reading that at least grants one a basic understanding of the Marxist method, one's revolutionary praxis will be essentially impotent and thus not revolutionary at all. To be honest, we live in a modern world. 
So I think it's safe to say that one does not even need to read a physical book in order to establish one's understanding of theory. There are so many ways in which one can consume information these days, such as audiobooks, YouTube videos, web pages, etc. A comrade or a potential comrade can study theory in whatever way works best for them. The important thing is that they study theory. The second myth that must be dispelled is the strange idea, or strange coming from Marxists at least, that it is for some reason impossible for members of the deprived classes of society, one of such classes being the lumpen proletariat, to read and understand Marxist theory. This myth is constructed from a tiny bit of truth that props up a great mass of falsehood in the minds of those who believe it. The tiny bit of truth contained in this myth is that in the period of class struggle preceding the socialist revolution, it may indeed be difficult for a great many of the members of the classes exploited or broken by capitalism to put in the time and work required to understand Marxist theory. This is because the objective material conditions that characterize their positions in society restrict their activities to only what is necessary for their continued survival, nothing more. For example, one would no doubt find it difficult to convince a lumpen who constantly fears becoming the next victim of the violent gang conflict in which he is embroiled while simultaneously pushing as much dope as he can so that he can make enough money to prevent himself from going to bed hungry that night to drop what he's doing and spend two hours trying to decipher the first chapter of Marx's Capital. Such a person literally would not have the luxury of being able to choose how he allocates his time. Even if he was presented with the choice to learn what capitalism is and how he has been harmed by it so that he could fully engage in the struggle for his own liberation, he would not be able to make that choice because he is working desperately to avoid getting shot or starving in the future. And quite frankly, those are more pressing issues. Oftentimes, the immediate interests of the classes impoverished by capitalism prevent many members of those classes from acting in a manner in line with their long-term interests. Luckily, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, one of the greatest communist revolutionaries of all time, developed through arduous study and struggle a tried and true remedy to issues such as these. That remedy, which Mao considered one of the three magic weapons of a revolutionary people, is the organization of professional revolutionaries known as the Vanguard Party. Lenin recognized that because a large portion of the popular masses were unable to engage in the practices necessary for them to secure their liberation from capitalist society simply because they were prevented from doing so by the objective social and economic conditions they were subjected to, the masses would have to produce an organ of political power that was free from the restrictions that bound themselves. In his pamphlet, What is to be Done?, Lenin described that organ of political power, now known as the Vanguard Party, like so. The organization of the Revolutionary Social Democratic Party must inevitably be of a kind different from the organization of the workers designed for this struggle. The workers' organization must in the first place be a trade union organization. Secondly, it must be as broad as possible. And thirdly, it must be as public as conditions will allow. Here and further on, of course, I refer only to absolutist Russia. On the other hand, the organization of the revolutionaries must consist first and foremost of people who make revolutionary activity their profession, for which reason I speak of the organization of revolutionaries, meaning revolutionary social democrats. In view of this common characteristic of the members of such an organization, all distinctions as between workers and intellectuals, not to speak of distinctions of trade and profession in both categories, must be effaced. Lenin realized that one of the things socialist revolutions needed most were organizations of professional revolutionaries. Theory is inseparable from practice as we established earlier. So it is mandatory that the members of a revolutionary party are able to devote the time and effort necessary to read and understand theory, even if most of the members of the class the party represents are unable to immediately do the same. Practice is inseparable from theory. So it is also mandatory that the members of a revolutionary party are capable of an extraordinary degree of organizational flexibility that would be impossible for many members of the popular classes to achieve due to their ensnarement in a daily routine of wage slavery or other means of survival. Lenin, unlike the propagators of the myth I seek to dispel here, completely rejected the idea that poor people are somehow completely incapable of comprehending Marxism, as he viewed the Vanguard Party as one that would consist 
both of former intellectuals whose position of privilege and society afforded them the opportunity to read and develop a firm understanding of Marxism with ease, as well as former workers who work twice as hard as their privileged counterparts to comprehend the theoretical basis of the arduous struggle they were prepared to wage for their own liberation. Further still, Lenin explained there could not be a distinction between intellectuals and workers in the vanguard party, and asserted that it was possible to eradicate the distinction between worker and intellectual entirely. Lenin developed his revolutionary conception of a vanguard party many years before he would find himself at the head of the October Revolution, an event which marked the dawn of an era of socialist revolutions around the world. During that revolutionary era, Lenin's theoretical conception of the eradication of the distinction between theory-savvy intellectuals and workers who know much about the harshness of capitalism from practical experience was applied and greatly extended in socialist China by Mao Zedong. Mao sought not only to eliminate the distinction between intellectuals and workers in the Chinese Communist Party, but also to extend Lenin's vision all the way to its logical conclusion, which was the complete eradication of the intellectual worker distinction from society as a whole. During the height of the Cultural Revolution, which could be described as the furthest advancement of socialism achieved by any country in history, the breakdown of the intellectual worker distinction rapidly accelerated. The astonishing results of the breakdown of that distinction, which is perhaps the most damning evidence I can provide in refutation of the idea that the impoverished popular classes cannot comprehend theory, can best be summed up by one of the stories from the Qingqian Production Brigade, recorded in the text, Philosophy is no mystery, peasants put their study to work. Party member Zhang Jinglong had toiled for the landlords 29 years in the old society and had profound proletarian feelings for Chairman Mao. Though he was illiterate, he was determined to study philosophy. He lost three nights sleep trying to fathom the meaning of one divides into two. With the help of Chang Zhuang, Chang Jinglong had begun reviewing his thinking and work in the light of one dividing into two. He thought, when China suffered temporary economic difficulties between 1960 and 1962, I lost much of my concern for the collective interest. I hold my private plot energetically, but on the collective land, it was another thing. I hold with two types of energy, one for collective and the other for myself. Aren't these in contradiction? It reflected the struggle in my mind between the two roads and the two ways of thinking. From then on, Chang Chung Liang always tried to be first in fighting self and criticizing revisionism, always putting the collective interest first. The poor and lower middle peasants said he studied well and elected him to represent the poor and lower middle peasants association at a province level meeting. Chang Chung Liang told how he applied Chairman Mao's philosophic concepts to practice. The masses praised his speech and suggested that it should be published in the press. The manuscript went to a capitalist rotor in the propaganda department under the former provincial party committee, who read it and shook his head. I don't believe that an illiterate peasant can study so well, he said, and suppressed the article. The purpose of my inclusion of this story into this section of the video was twofold. Part of my purpose for including the story, which I hope I have made clear by now, was to completely disprove the myth that one social class can somehow render one unable to read or understand Marxism, even in cases in which someone was literally rendered unable to read by their social class. Chang Chung Myung is a perfect example of how, in the right conditions, a person impoverished by the ruthless exploiter class can still make the massive leap from illiterate revolutionary aspirant to an extremely well-read revolutionary savant and expert dialectician. To all comrades who hold opinions akin to those of the capitalist rotors in the Chinese Communist Party and refuse to believe that a poor person can make the great leap from illiteracy to diligent studier, I raise you the example of Comrade Chiang, whose story of success proves you wrong. The second purpose of my inclusion of Comrade Chiang's story in this section of the video was for this story to serve as a segue to a similar story, with the main differences being that the following story is about a member of the Lumpen proletariat, not the agrarian peasantry, and the story takes place in the first world imperialist country that is the United States, not in a third world socialist nation like China was during the events of the previous story. This is the story of the political education of Comrade Sanika Shakur, a communist and black nationalist who was once a crip and who has been mentioned countless times in my videos. 
The story, which he tells during an interview conducted by MOI Jr., was the following. When I first came to the camps in 1985, I couldn't really read, perhaps on a fifth grade level. I had no real comprehension, and certainly I couldn't write. See, I need to explain this. In the subculture of Bangan, it wasn't about being literate or articulate. And it wasn't about books or academia. It was about action war, about being physical and macho. Dig? So Sandika started his story by informing MOI Jr. that much like Comrade Xiang, he was essentially illiterate prior to becoming a revolutionary. Sinika explains this to be a consequence of the fact that gang culture does not exactly encourage literacy in any way. Sinika continues by saying, So once I found myself in the hole at San Quentin in 1986, I was stuck because here I was, this OG dude, you know, with major street clout and a growing prison rep, but I couldn't read, comprehend, or write, so I had to face that had to confront that and either go around, you know, or deny it or challenge it and resolve it. Here, Sinika explained that his struggle with illiteracy was a deeply personal one, one that affected his own self-image and one that presented him with a choice. He could either remain at the level of literacy he was at upon entering prison and lie to cover up his area of lack or he could engage in the painstaking task of educating himself and be rewarded with new skills and a great deal of personal growth. Sinika, who has never been one to shy away from struggle, chose the latter, only to find that he wasn't really alone in his journey after all, as he goes on to explain. And luckily for me, I had cats around me who were interested in growth and development on an intellectual level. Oh, don't get me wrong, I tried to buffalo my way through at first. I tried to fake it, but the brothers wasn't letting me off the hook that easy. In prison, Senika found other Lumpen who wished to help him. These Lumpen just so happened to be Lumpen revolutionaries. They put in the necessary effort to aid him in his personal journey of self-improvement through education, and they held him accountable for his own progress to ensure that he didn't give up. Sanyika had plenty of motivation to learn, but his history as a black lumpen in the United States and his status as a penniless prisoner put major roadblocks in the way of his learning process. He continued the story with a description of those roadblocks. So once I got my reading and comprehension up to par, I started reading what was on the tier books that were in circulation. I had no funds to order my own books so I had to read what was available. This was the staple material. Soul Dad Brother, Blood in My Eye, Wretched of the Earth, and there was the Burning Spear newspaper of the African Socialist Party. But let me say this, I didn't really know how to study at that time. I was reading the material and emotionally attaching myself to what I could understand. I hadn't fully understood the extent to which I need to go in order to transform my criminal, colonial mentality into a revolutionary mentality. Dig? That's a serious point there, because without knowing the extent to which you are contaminated by criminality and colonialism, one will not understand the extent of struggle required to cleanse. Dig? Here, Sinika revealed that in prison, certain revolutionary literature is automatically available even to penniless prisoners because such literature is passed around by the class-conscious section of the prison population. In Sinika's prison, this literature included some significant works written by black communists, including two works by comrade George Jackson, a Black Panther who got life in prison for stealing $70, as well as Fanon's famous work on decolonization and the newspaper of a Black Communist Party that reaches out to prisoners. This is how Seneca Shukur was able to overcome the first of the aforementioned roadblocks, but how he overcame the second, which he described as the contamination of his mind by colonial and criminal mentality, is something he waited to the end of the story to explain. He concluded the story by telling MOI Jr. that At that stage in 86 in San Quentin, I just thought revolution was physical violence. I thought we'd only need to gather enough people together in order to get free. I had an ill notion about what we were trying to get free from 
and further to get free too. That is, I didn't truly overstand capitalism, imperialism, or colonialism, nor did I overstand self-determination or socialism. I thought we were fighting against racism. I didn't begin to overstand what was really going on until I learned how to study and then attain the material that corresponded with my reality. The end of Seneca's story reveals to us some of the essential factors that make or break the process of the political education of Lumpen. One of them is an individual member of the Lumpen proletariat's development of the knowledge of how to study, i.e. how they can not just read and understand theory, but comprehend it, criticize it, and most of all recognize how it relates to, explains, or does not explain the world around them and their personal experience. The second factor is an individual Lumpen proletarian's access to theoretical material relevant to them, which Seneca so eloquently described as his attainment of material that corresponded with his reality. I think that it is significant that Soldad Brother, Blood in My Eye, and The Wretched of the Earth were some of the first Marxist texts that Seneca ever got the chance to read. Fanon's Wretched is about matters extremely relevant to colonized black people, and the two George Jackson books are extremely relevant to colonized black prisoners specifically. The significance of these books lies in their relevance to the personal experiences of the reader in question. Seneca may not have been as open to the theory espoused in other texts often put forward as introductions to communism, such as the Manifesto or the State and Revolution, because on a surface level, those texts may have seemed like they espoused theory unrelated to his experience. That's not to say that Seneca never read those texts, as he certainly has read them now that he is a well-read communist revolutionary, but it is very important that the first theoretical text that Seneca was introduced to showed him how the Marxist method could be applied to his own reality, and as Seneca explained at the end of his story, the more accurate the theoretical material he read was in successfully explaining his reality, the less clouded by colonial and criminal mentality his mind became. Many noteworthy Lumpen who became revolutionaries embarked on similar educational journeys to Seneca Shakur's. Some of these include James Yaki Sales, George Jackson, and even Malcolm X. What did all of their learning processes have in common? Well, a lot of things really, including the drive to learn about new ways of seeing the world, their complete abandonment of their past criminal lifestyles, and their total transformation into completely new individuals through said process. But the commonality that exists between the educational journeys of these men that I want to focus on here is actually the one that at first glance seems the most superficial. That is, the fact that all of these men became educated, both politically and in general, in prison. Earlier I described the hypothetical situation of a member of the Lumpen proletariat who is too caught up in his daily struggle for survival to engage in time-consuming practices like reading theory, despite the fact that they are necessary prerequisites for effective engagement in revolutionary praxis. I followed that story with an explanation of the concept of the Vanguard Party, which much consists of those individuals who are able to act as revolutionaries full-time on the behalf of those that are far too constrained by daily demands of capitalist society to do the same. All that said, the following question remains. In regards to the Lumpen, who among them are so removed from the normal daily life struggles of that class that they are able to form part of the vanguard? While there are a variety of specific situations that can lead to an individual's Lumpen proletarian's removal from their ensnarement in their usual daily life or death routine, Ironically, most Lumpen only escape the prison of their daily struggle to survive when they are literally imprisoned. Malcolm X explained the significance of this fact in the following quote from his autobiography. A prisoner has time that he can put to good use. I'd put prison second to college as the best place for a man to go if he needs to do some thinking. If he's motivated, in prison, he can change his life. When a member of the Lumpen proletariat is incarcerated, they are ripped out of the daily struggle for survival in which they are normally ensnared, and locked up in prisons which, despite being horrible places full of dangers different than those found on the outside, also happen to grant Lumpen a great deal of free time that they could potentially use, and often do use, to pursue their political education. 
Malcolm X went on to explain that. Prison enabled me to study far more intensively than I would have if my life had gone differently and I had attended some college. Where else but in prison could I have attacked my ignorance by being able to study intensely sometimes as much as 15 hours a day? Like the prison experience of Sanika Shakur, the prison experience of Malcolm X shows that prison is one of the few places that Lumpen often find themselves in which the rigorous pursuit of political education and self-transformation into professional revolutionaries fit for any vanguard is possible. This is a process that can occur and is occurring in mass. In his essay on transforming the colonial and criminal mentality, which was written in prison, by the way, the briefly aforementioned black communist James Yaki Sales took the idea of the mass education of incarcerated Lumpen to its logical conclusion when he wrote, PAIGC cadres spent years in their school in Conakry before they returned and began their work with the people. In other countries where national liberation struggles were and are taking place, the leading bodies in these struggles had schools established inside and outside the country where ideological and military training took place. ZANU cadre were so trained in Tanzania, our cadres are being and will be trained in places like Statesville, Trenton, San Quentin, Attica, and Angola, LA. Our cadres are in what we must consciously recognize as training schools in Bedford Hills, Jackson, Terre Haute, Dwight, Atlanta, and Alderson, and all other prisons and jails in America. Comrade Yaki was correct. Prisons in first world countries have the potential to be used by the lumpen section of the communist movement in our countries to educate new cadre that arise from the ranks of the lumpen proletarian masses. Many of the institutions in the first world that are equivalent to the cadre training schools of third world revolutionaries can exist secretly within the prisons of such nations. As for the specifics of how the processes of political education of imprisoned lumpen can be carried out, some prisoners affiliated with the Maoist internationalist movement who are currently facilitating such processes right now wrote a guide on how Lumpen and other prisons can do the same. I did a reading of that guide, and I will include a link to the audio text of that reading in the description. The authors of that guide are truly engaged in great work, and I have no doubt that their efforts will yield great advances in the struggle against capitalism in the United States and bring us one step closer to communist revolution. Before I wrap this section up, I want to clarify that I do not believe that Lumpen necessarily have to get locked up in order for them to have any chance at becoming communist revolutionaries. I'm only arguing that it is difficult for many Lumpen to devote a great deal of time to revolutionary struggle while also devoting much of their time to the struggle to meet their life needs. Even though in much of this section of the video, I have emphasized the importance of taking the time to read revolutionary theory while simultaneously denouncing the pragmatic comrades who downplay the importance of theory due to their preference for praxis. I admit that it is very possible that the best method of promoting the political education of Lumpen in fact begins with concrete praxis. If communists can show Lumpen that we fight for the life needs of all people and that our organizations are a preferable alternative to the criminal organizations that many members of the Lumpen proletariat are forced to join for survival, it is possible that they may see fit to join our organizations. Or their organizations may transition away from criminal activity, but we'll talk about that in the next section. Various communist parties, composed mainly of Lumpen, such as the Black Panther Party or the Young Lords, attracted potential members of their parties that way, and then helped educate these potential cadre after the aspirant radicals chose the revolution over life on the streets. At the end of the day, no matter when or where a Lumpen decides to join the revolutionary struggle, communists in first world countries, especially class conscious Lumpen, should do everything within our power to help them learn how to fight capitalism and secure their own liberation. The Political Organization of Lumpen for the Class Struggle while earlier in this video we learned from the analysis of the capitalist world system developed by Samir Amin that the center of global class struggle has shifted from the core countries to the peripheral ones, that doesn't mean that there is no class struggle going on in the first world, nor does it mean that the class struggles in first world nations are not important. 
Class struggle does exist in the first world, even if it is somewhat stagnant at this time, and it is the goal of communists within the first world to engage in it, intensify it, and bring it to its final conclusion. Looping communists could organize for a wide variety of forms of class struggle in a just as wide variety of ways. To attempt to list all the possibilities for Lumpen organizing in this section of the video would be impossible, so instead I will focus on two very important ways that Lumpen could organize for class struggle. It is important that we remember that in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels wrote the following on the subject of the individual struggles waged by revolutionaries prior to the complete overthrow of capitalism. The real fruit of their battles lies not in the immediate result but in the ever-expanding union of the workers. We must take the analysis of Marx and Engels to heart and recognize that both of the following types of struggle that Lumpen could engage in or are engaging in are significant not because of the immediate gains that Lumpen's victory may produce, but because of the fact that engaging in such struggles strengthen the Lumpen as a class as well as their alliance with the regular proletariat, thus better preparing them for their final battle against capitalism. One form of revolutionary organizing that Lumpen could engage in is a radical campaign to end or drastically decrease violence between Lumpen organizations, aka gangs or LOs for short, by completely transforming the nature of such organizations from violent, illegal businesses ran by what UEP Newton called illegitimate capitalists, to benign cultural groupings, or better yet, full-on revolutionary organizations. While this may seem like a campaign with a completely unrealistic aim at first, the fact is, there is precedent for this kind of transformation of Lumpen organizations. Before I talk about that, however, it's best that I first present a scientific view of exactly what an LO is. Most people think of LOs as nothing more than aggregates of violent youth who seek to commit crimes in a group. Marxists ha often have a deeper understanding of LOs and recognize those organizations as essentially illegal enterprises that generate revenue from drugs, human trafficking, and outright thievery, while simultaneously exploiting the labor of drug pushers and sex workers. All of this is true, to various degrees depending on the LO in question, but it is only half of the story. As Marxists, we must strive to dig deep below the surface level appearance of a thing so that we can understand its true nature. When we dig deeper behind the surface appearance of LOs, deeper than even the standard Marxist analysis of such organizations, it becomes clear that there are really two major functions of LOs. The parasitic economic element that is divisive and bleeds conflict between Lumpen and the cultural social element that actually creates unity among Lumpen, within certain limits defined by the opposite function of LOs, of course. In a truly dialectical fashion, these two functions are opposites of one another and are the two aspects of an internal contradiction that lies at the heart of all LOs. Historically speaking, many of the modern LOs in the US, such as the Bloods and the Crips, were formed after the collapse of the Black Panther Party an event which left young black Lumpen without any kind of unifying organization that could provide them with a sense of belonging in a world completely hostile to them. The Bloods and Crips were two of the organizations formed by these Lumpen to replace the BPP. In some ways, they succeeded. The problem was, these new organizations were a parasitic curse on the black community, unlike the BPP, which was a blessing. Sanyika Shakur's description of the view he once had of the Crips in the same interview quoted earlier in this video corroborates my explanation of the nature of those two infamous LOs. I was 11 when I was sponsored in. To me, it was a black organization, dig? And we were armed. Of course, we, unlike the Panthers, were criminals and parasites. Though, as a youth, not knowing the particulars, it wasn't no difference. As one can tell from this quote, Black Lumpen often participate in gang activity because they see their LOs as cultural organizations for Black people. The problem is, such organizations also exploit and hurt Black people and create armed conflicts between Black people as a result of their other function, that of an illegal business. 
To broaden this analysis to Elos throughout the First World, Elos that can't be described as the independent social and cultural institutions of a nationally oppressed group can still be described and seen as independent social and cultural institutions of an oppressed class, which is, of course, the Lumpen. People in the streets don't have country clubs. They don't have Masonic lodges or fraternities or rotary clubs. All they have are the other people on the streets alongside them, fighting for survival by any means necessary, just like they are. That and a desire to be part of something larger than themselves. That is why they form LOs. If LOs didn't deal drugs, steal, pimp, start beef with other LOs, etc., they would be nothing more than the lumpen equivalent of any of the social or cultural institutions for rich people I just listed. It is the social and cultural significance LOs have to their class that has informed the following message from the group of radical lumpen known as street groomers to the LOs of America, which was included in their manifesto. We do not judge the so-called gangs, what we call the street tribes, because in fact, you often provided us with the only family and support that we knew and are grateful for that. And we realize that you organized to protect and serve yourselves and your communities because those charged with doing so did not. And in fact, instead terrorize our communities by serving those true gangs and business suits and the state capitals and corporations and the courts who victimize and still do our communities. We are asking you to unite with us, a uniting of the street tribes, drop the turf wars, so that we can work together to clean up the streets and overthrow the shackles of this plantation system of oppression. The street groomers rightfully chose the unification of LOs as their goal, rather than the eradication of them, because they correctly identified the organizations as more than just illegal businesses or enterprises, but also social and cultural institutions with the potential to contribute to the overall unity of the Lumpen proletariat. However, do not think that they left the issue of the anti-people activities from which LOs profit unaddressed. They also wrote, we do not judge anyone for trying to survive, especially if you grew up on the streets or have a family to support. However, we cannot tolerate anyone targeting and bullying another brother or sister in order to survive. We are aware that this country was built on just that, bullying, enslaving, oppressing, assassinating primarily people of color on the backs of the black, brown, and red peoples, not just in this country, but worldwide and that this is still primarily a plantation system dominated by white supremacists, whether in government, commerce, churchianity, the courts, and law enforcement. However, part of that system's method of operation to preserve its dominance is to keep us divided and attacking one another. So we must not play their game by hurting and killing each other, whether by drugs or with guns. The street groomers seek to unite LOs against the capitalist world system, but only if those LOs abandon their parasitic nature entirely. They essentially call for the total transformation of LOs from criminal organizations with cultural significance to revolutionary organizations engaged in the struggle against capitalism. If such a transformation of LOs did occur, it would definitely contribute to the expansion of the union of the masses that Marx and Engels said we should aim for, as it would put an end to long-standing divisions between lumpen and promote unity in the class, thus strengthening it. The street groomers' goal is noble, no doubt, but is it achievable? Is it a goal that other political organizations of the Lumpen should fight for? The fact that there are so many historical examples of LOs becoming revolutionary organizations or coming under the influence of revolutionary thought in some capacity suggests that it is possible for the cultural function of these LOs to prevail over their parasitic function and choose their class interests over their interests in profit. One of these examples is the Young Lords, who began as a Puerto Rican gang, but evolved into a Puerto Rican Communist Party influenced by Mao Zedong thought. Two more examples include the Consolidated Crip Organization and the United Blood Nation. In his autobiography, Monster, the Autobiography of an LA Gang Member, Sinika Shakur recounted his encounters with the former LO. During this encounter, the CCO told him that, we in the Consolidated Crip Organization, or CCO, believe that Crips means Clandestine Revolutionary Internationalist Party Soldiers. 
and with this knowledge of ourselves, we believe we as a tribe have an obligation to our people. We don't disrespect our people, and we don't fight against the United Blood Nation. According to the CCO, the United Blood Nation was the vanguard organization in the Leninist sense of the term of the Bloods. Total peace existed between them. Conflict between gangs, which the CCO described as quote-unquote tribalism, was strictly prohibited within their organization. The previous three LOs fully transitioned from criminal organizations to revolutionary ones. The Latin Kings and the Black Peace Stone Nation, on the other hand, are two examples of organizations that have definitely come under the influence of revolutionary ideology, but are not yet revolutionary organizations. The Latin Kings are still a criminal organization, but they adhere to a radical ideology called Kingism, which they sort of explained in a manifesto that just so happens to be full of clearly Leninist and Third Worldist terminology. Check it out for yourself if you're interested. The link to it is in the description. The Black Beast Stone Nation started as a regular gang and then transformed into a black nationalist organization. This caught the attention of the head of the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan, who introduced them to the revolutionary socialist Sandinistas in Nicaragua, as well as the now martyred former president of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. The most interesting part of their story is the fact that they almost carried out armed actions against the US government for Gaddafi, but their plan was foiled. All in all, what these examples should have made clear is the fact that LOs can be transformed into revolutionary organizations, and that Lumpen revolutionaries could make efforts to encourage such transformations as the street groomers do, so that they may cut down on the interclass violence in the Lumpen proletariat and broaden the united front against capitalism and imperialism in the core countries. In an earlier section of this video, we addressed the subject of political education behind prison walls. In this section of the video, we will address the subject of political organization behind prison walls. There are many horrible aspects of the prison systems of most first world countries, solitary confinement, poor food quality, police abuse, etc. But in this video, I will talk about one bad aspect of prison that places prisoners who organize to change it in direct confrontation with the bourgeoisie. The aspect I have in mind is low prison wages. According to an Algeriza article I will link to in the description, in the United States, it is fully legal for prisoners to receive less than $1 an hour for their labor. There is no labor aristocracy in prison. The consequence of this is that prisons have become powder kegs for radical labor activism that are just waiting to explode. In many places, such as, of course, the United States, such explosions of class struggle behind bars already have occurred and are continuing to occur again and again as prisoners get angrier and the capitalist parasites continue to super exploit them. For example, according to that same Algeriza article, in 2016, 24,000 US prisoners across 29 prisons went on strike as part of one of the largest prison labor strikes in US history. This was a massive show of force by the prisoners and a fantastic example of the immense potential of lumpen organizing around the issue of super exploitation in prison, as it pitted a great deal of lumpen who had endured some of the worst exploitation capitalism has to offer directly against the most twisted capitalist enterprises in America and their bourgeois owners. That strike no doubt raised class consciousness among the incarcerated lumpen of the US a great deal, and if other US lumpen can create more situations of that sort, or if lumpen in other first world countries can produce similar struggles where they live, the incarcerated lumpen will no doubt manage to advance the anti-capitalist struggle in the first world by a great deal. Conclusion Will the lumpen be the class that brings the spirit of people's war from the third world to the first? I cannot say. What I can say for certain, however, is that many lumpen in the core countries are beginning to open their eyes and minds, and have started to see and understand the class society that has tormented them all of their lives. When met with the idea of people's war, those lumpen, unlike their fellow countrymen who live better than them, do not flinch. They have recognized that capitalism has already filled their lives with war. Gang wars, the war on drugs, and even the chemical warfare tactics employed by militarized riot police are all familiar to them. They know what it is like to be in firefights or witness them. They know what it is like to kill or be killed, to steal or starve, to fear for their lives. Nowadays, 
What's the difference between a militarized police and an army? Or a rival gang member and a guerrilla waiting in ambush? Many Lumpens spend much of their lives being hunted simultaneously by both types of enemy combatants. So it should be no surprise that when contemplating the idea of people's war, the class-conscious Lupin comes first to the realization that Berthold Breck spelled out in words, there's always war in the cities. Then they come to a second realization, recalling Malcolm X. Sometimes to put down the gun. You have to pick it up. 